All right. This is our second case on uh, the top on the topic of uh, damages for breach of contract. And this particular case, we are talking about the the subtopic is measure of damages. So this case from uh, British India, AKS Jamal versus Mullah Daud. We're just going to call this uh, Jamal versus Daud for short. So if we go to the facts of the case, so the question that you were asked was, why can't uh, Dao and Sons get the benefit of the increased prices relative to the market price on the date of the breach, which were realized, uh, which were realized when uh, Jamal sold the shares after uh, the date of the breach. Okay, so let's just uh, get some of the stylized facts, some of the actual facts, and then we're going to stylize. Uh, we're going to just change a, some of the facts into round figures, some of the prices into round figures for convenience. Okay, so the fact is, so Jamal, this is a contract for sale of shares. Okay, and under the Indian Sale of Goods Act, stocks and shares are considered goods. So this contract for the sale of shares, although this particular uh, case predates uh, the Indian Sale of Goods Act, so you're deciding this really under the, the common law uh, with respect to sale of goods and sale of shares. So we have the facts here where Jamal is the seller and Dawood is the buyer. And you have, actually we are dealing with several contracts, there are about six contracts mentioned in the case. But we're gonna just simplify things and assume that there's just one contract. The principles will not change. So there was, actually we had contracts between, all the way between, uh, from April to August 1911. And the settlement date uh, for the contracts was uh, 30th December. Okay, so the date for the delivery of shares and the payment for those shares. So what happens is that on the settlement uh, date, the buyer fails to pay the sale price. So there is a breach of contract and the seller eventually what happens is then, and there are some, uh, then the seller uh, requires, uh, I mean, uh, sends notice to the buyer. The buyer sets, uh, you know, so presents a claim of set off, essentially claiming that I also am um, owed some monies by you, the seller. So all this uh, back and forth negotiation goes on, which is documented in great detail in the case, which we're not going into. We're just going to talk about some negotiations that happened. And eventually what happened is these negotiations failed. The negotiations failed. And the, so we can write down negotiations here. And eventually they fail. So the buyer, the seller eventually sells the shares at prices which are higher than uh, that which prevailed, and then those prices, uh, then the price that prevailed on the date of the breach. Okay, so here you can see, so the date of the breach is 30th December 1911, and the uh, sh sh shares were sold from 26 February 2012 onwards. And uh, he realized an average price higher than the price of the, on the date of the breach. Now, why has this case come up to the court whose judgment you're reading? This is because the uh, the court below has actually decided that the seller, okay, so let's, before we get into the actual controversy in the case, let's now artificially uh, declare some prices uh, on the basis of which we're going to discuss the principle in this case. So we're going to say, we're going to assume that uh, instead of looking at the actual prices on the case, uh, we're going to just assume that the contract for sale of shares was uh, at uh, 600 rupees per share. And then the price on the settlement date, which is the date of the breach of the contract, the price of those same shares were for the market price was 400 rupees per share. And then eventually when the seller further down the road uh, sold those shares after the negotiations failed, uh, he, so he was able to sell them at an average price of 500 rupees per share. So these are the artificial numbers with which we will discuss the case. Now, what are the issues in the case? What happens in the lower court is that with respect to these artificial prices, the lower court decides that uh, the seller, uh, while he's entitled to claim damages from for breach of contract from the buyer for having defaulted uh, in payment, he has to give the buyer the, def uh, the benefit of the increase in prices from 400 to 500 between the date of the breach and the date of the final sale of shares. So therefore the buyer is uh, entitled uh, 
the seller is entitled to receive damages only of rupees 100 per share that is 600 minus 500 whereas the buyer claims the seller claims that this is not correct and the seller is saying that uh, he should get the benefit of uh, the difference between the contract price and the price of the market price of shares on the date of the breach of the contract that is 400 so here you can see here what I've done here is uh, stated the issues in the case uh, uh, the prima facie issue in the case is is the buyer liable for 600 minus 400 that is 200 rupees per share this is what the seller is claiming this is the buyers liability that is 200 or is the seller liable only for uh, is the buyer liable only for 100 rupees which is what the court below has decided that the buyer is only liable for 600 minus 500 since the seller was able to sell the shares at 500 he should not have a right to claim more than that uh, more than the difference between 600 the contract price and the price at which the shares were eventually sold so this is an important actually this is quite and now if you look at the underlying issue as I said, we should always look at the issue at two levels. One is the issue prima facie in the case, which is intimately tied to the facts of the case and cannot be transferred to any other case because every case is different as far as the facts, is concern, facts are concerned. But there is a way to state the issue in the case uh, as an underlying issue, which uh, involves a level of abstraction and uh, an attempt to understand what the real underlying principle is that is being debated in this case that is being sort of uh, fought over in this case and so that when you state the issue in that form you are able to then when you get the decision in the case you're able to then quickly identify the ratio descendant of the case so here as the court actually here I'm extracting the judgment uh, from the judgment of the court of the higher court uh, so the here the underlying issue is really this is the measure of damages the difference between the contract price and the market price at the date of the breach since this is going to be our answer let's just put this in bold okay so this is really the underlying issue or uh, obviously there is an obligation on the part of the non-breaching party to mitigate the damages uh, or is the seller going to receive the benefit of sales uh, of any, any sale that occurs eventually at a at a higher price if the is the buyer going to get the benefit of that so this is the real question is this the real is this the is this the real principle uh, that ought to prevail or not this is the way that you would state the underlying issue right so this is why this 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 case uh, we are discussing as a on the subtopic of measure of damages okay so here you come to the point where the court uh, discusses uh, the different laws so I'm, I'm trying to follow the FILAC or the IRAC framework so we've stated the we've stated the facts we've stated the issues now we're looking at the laws which is in the FILAC framework legal principles or in the IRAC framework the rules okay so essentially the legal principles that are going to be uh, that are relevant for this case so here the court uh, this is going to be decided uh, mainly by precedence and um, here the court cites this particular case uh, Red Okanashi versus Melbourne and it was upheld in the House of Lords, remember the House of Lords is the is the highest court in the United Kingdom. Um, was until very recently when they've got their uh, when, when they got their Supreme Court. Uh, so in was upheld by the House of Lords, Williams versus uh, Aegis. This is the case where uh, the House of Lords upholds the same principle. Okay, so remember this case is happening in British India, 1915, 1915. Yeah, so I think this goes to the Privy Council and um, okay so the house of, so obviously opinions of the house of lords are uh, are considered very important even in post-independence india okay and so in british india obviously this would be very important and um, so they uh, they would uh, defer a lot to this kind of uh, opinion and so this is the important judicial precedent that is being used to establish this principle or reaffirm this principle that uh, this is the decisive and this is how the key way the main uh, this is the way to measure uh, the damages to take the measure of damages in in these kinds of contracts okay so uh, then you have the second principle where they for the for which they've cited this case uh, Stanford but which is basically uh, 
again another well-established principle of the common law uh, of contracts that if the plaintiff has a duty to uh, do I mean the plaintiff that is the non breaching party has a duty to do everything possible to mitigate the losses arising from the breach of contract and anything he does uh, to this end uh, the the breaching party is entitled to receive the benefit of okay and then the third one which is uh, particular to this case actually where they says that where they've talked about the situation in this particular case where the uh, the non-breaching party held on to the shares beyond the date of the breach and eventually was able to sell them at prices higher than the price which prevailed on the date of the breach but this as the court says here uh, the, this is a benefit which should not be passed on to the buyer that is the breaching party all right so this is essentially like what you see what what, what you see what is happening is so here that the court does the analysis if you look at uh, if you look at a part in the case where the court says this is the part I've extracted okay which is yeah on the date of the breach of the contract let's look at the actual judgment to see the proper um, yeah this is the part in the judgment which is important upon breach by the purchaser his contractual right to the shares fell to the ground okay so this is how the court is analyzing the um, how the title passes between buyer and seller uh, upon the conclusion of the contract upon the breach of contract and what is actually happening uh, when the seller decides to hold on to the goods uh, to the shares beyond the date of the breach okay so let's look at this what actually happens on the date of the contract is uh, let's look at uh, yeah this is uh, third point essentially that to, to understand how the court is view, viewing the buyers the sellers action and holding on to the shares so step one what happens is when the contract was concluded in April the various contracts were concluded between April to August of 1911 the on the date of the contract when the once the contract is completed the property in the shares passed to the buyer because remember the shares were very specific both parties knew which shares they were talking about and so there is a and so how do we come to this conclusion on the date of the contract the property in the shares passed to the buyer and remember here property is being used in the sense of an intangible to refer to the rights of ownership okay let's look at section 20 of the Indian sale of goods act which once again is based on the English sale of goods act so um, this is just the bear act so I have somewhere here yeah I have section 20 of the Indian sale of goods act this is also all right okay so let's look at section 20 look at the effects of the contract of uh, the transfer of property as between seller and buyer okay so we have section 18 uh, section 19 which says property passes when intended to pass but then in the subsequent sections we have various statements regarding specific uh, types of transactions when does property pass look at specific goods in a deliverable state look at section 20 look at this there's an unconditional unconditional contract for the sale of specific goods in a deliverable state the property in the goods passes to the buyer when the contract is made okay so if you're looking at a transaction for the sale of shares okay this is a typical simple transaction a standard transaction for the state of sale of shares is an unconditional contract it is a contract for the sale of specific goods and those goods are in a deliverable state okay because you have a share certificate in those days you did not have electronic uh, settlement of uh, of uh, share transactions that would render them even more deliverable even more uh, in a deliverable state so you have all the section all the ingredients of section 20 of the indian sale of goods act which once again being a reflection of the uk sale of goods act is essentially a handy codification of the uh, principles of English common law of the English common law of contracts and specifically contracts for the sale of goods now so if you have this kind of a thing so you could look at section 20 and look at the principles uh, laid down here to conclude that to conclude what the court is actually implicitly acknowledging here that when the court says that on the date of the breach 
Upon breach by the purchaser, his contractual right to the shares fell to the ground, which means that prior to this breach, the purchaser, the, the buyer had a contractual right to the shares. And where does that right derive from? That right derives from Section 20, from the principles laid down in Section 20 of the Sale of Goods Act, specific goods in a deliverable state, unconditional contract. So property in the goods passes to the buyer when the contract is made, as soon as the contract is made. So that's why I've written this here in step one, on the date of the contract, the completion of the contract, formation of the contract, property in the shares pass to the buyer from the seller. Now, when there is a breach, as the court has uh, explained, on the date of the breach, the property in the shares returns to the buyer. I've not written proper English sentences with correct grammar to save time, but this is what it means. So the property in the shares returns to the buyer because, the, as the court says here, upon breach by the purchaser, his contractual right to the shares fell to the ground. So this is what happens. So now, once again, uh, the seller is the owner of the goods of the shares on the date of the breach, once he has received news of the breach. So now what is that? What is the, uh, if you go back to this third point that on the law point, uh, on, the que on the question of the, applicable, the uh, applicability of the legal principles, um, on, uh, on the question of the legal principles that apply to this case, when the court is saying this, but the fact that by reason of the loss of the contract, which the defendant has failed to perform, there should be a comma here, the plaintiff obtains the benefit of another contract, which is of value to him. Okay, what is the court actually talking about here? They could have explained it a little bit better. Essentially, what the court is imagining is, and what the court sees, date of the contract, property passes to buyer. Date of the breach, property returns to seller. This should not be buyer, this should be actually seller. This is a typo because I've copied it from buyer. Okay, so uh, property and share returns to seller. Okay, now what happens is the court imagines that, and when the court looks at the transaction or at the buyer's action, at the seller's actions in not selling the shares on the date of the breach, but holding on to those shares and selling them much later, the court essentially says to the seller, or the court sees the seller is doing two things, okay? It's as if notionally the seller did two transactions on the date of the breach of the contract. The seller is imagined by the court as having sold his shares at 400 on the date of the breach and immediately bought back those very same shares at 400 in a separate transaction. Okay, so this new deal, the second part of the deal, the second when the seller is deemed to have bought back the shares of 400, this is a separate deal which has nothing to do with the previous contract, which has been breached. So that's why the court is going to now tell the seller that uh, you got news of the breach, you knew that there was no contract uh, that was going to be honored. On the date of the breach, you got that information. So you are deemed to have sold those shares at the market price of 400 on that date. And it's as if you bought back those very same shares in a new contract, in new speculation. And this, as the court says, is the speculation of the seller and not that of the buyer. That is the speculation. It is the speculation of the non-breaching party, not the speculation of the breaching party. And that's why the court is eventually going to say that you are only entitled to the difference between the contract price and the market price on the date of the breach because we expect you to uh, to sell the shares on that day itself. Okay, uh, and if you don't, it's like you're buying a separate, you're entering into a separate contract after having sold those shares, you're buying them back at the market, creating a new set, a new deal and a new speculation, engaging in a new speculation. Okay, so, um, where has this issues prima facie appeared again? Okay, so this is actually a typo. This needs not need not appear again. Okay, all right. So here, this is just further extracting uh, extracted. This material is again extracted from the judgment, uh, which is he is not selling. We've already discussed this. Okay, all right. So therefore, uh, the answer to the question that the court poses at the beginning, uh, in terms of the underlying issue, is that yes, that is the way you measure the damage. Take the measure of damages. Okay.
uh, and this is not the is not that the seller is bound to reduce the damages by subsequent sales and better prices obviously because what happens with, as the court argues as part of its judgment um, as the court says if if this is actually the speculation of the seller uh, if this is actually the speculation of the um, if you go back to the judgment um, yeah here if you see that um, when it poses this underlying issue it says okay or is the seller bound to reduce the damages if he can by subsequent sales at better prices the court is questioning this uh, you know it's considering this uh, theory if he is if this theory is true that the seller is bound to reduce the damages if he can by subsequent sales at better prices subsequent meaning subsequent to the date of the breach of the contract that is further out in time and if if he is and if the purchaser is entitled to the benefit of subsequent sales it must also be true that he must bear the burden of subsequent losses okay that is the uh, not that is the breaching party so then they say that the latter proposition is impossible and therefore uh, and the former is uh, i mean both are actually equally unsound uh, that this that the breaching party should get the benefit of better sale better sale price realizations or should have to bear the burden of uh, worse sale price realizations um, occurring as a result of waiting beyond the date of the breach so by this uh, logical technique by this logical technique this kind of technique of argument is called uh, reductio ad absurdum that is you take uh, a, you take an argument you extend that argument logically see the logical steps uh, that follow from that from the extension of that argument and then you lead and then you show that that leads to an absurd conclusion and therefore you prove that that particular view uh, that particular viewpoint uh, cannot be the correct viewpoint because it leads to an absurd conclusion so this is called reductio ad absurdum okay so through this the court establishes establishes uh, what it already knew to be the well-established principle in the common law that um, this the measure of damages is this is the measure of damages okay all right so now this brings us to the second question that we were uh, that you were asked which is uh, I've quoted this part from the judge I've taken this extract extract from the judgment and uh, then uh, this part actually talks about the non breaching parties liability or duty to mitigate the losses arising from the breach of the contract uh, and I've asked you which section of the Indian Contract Act embodies this principle and the answer is section 73 the and in particular the explanation to section 73 okay uh, so some of you when I asked you you were not able to point out uh, where exactly in section 73 this was located it's important to understand that this principle the non breaching parties duty to mitigate losses uh, arising from the breach of contract this is actually enshrined in in the explanation to section 73 if you look at the explanation in estimating the loss or damage the means which existed of remedying the inconvenience caused by non-performance of the contract must be taken into account who is facing the inconvenience caused by non-performance surely not the breaching party the inconvenience is caused to the non-breaching party and so therefore the non-breaching party has to exercise whatever means are available to him uh, to uh, remedy the inconvenience cause that is to mitigate the losses uh, so you can see here how in the explanation uh, this particular principle has been enshrined okay so this is also one of the principles that we studied when we looked at the theoretical material for um, covering our cases on breach of contract we looked at the concept of general damages uh, special damages and then we looked at the duty uh, the non-breaching party's duty to mitigate the losses arising from the breach of contract right so this covers our uh, our purely legal analysis of this case and now we're going to go into the second part of the analysis of this case which is where we try to see if we can learn anything uh, from uh, related to the world of business and in particular to finance uh, from this very case it turns out that we can because we can use some of the important concepts uh, that are actually discussed in this case 
uh, and we can look at them from a finance perspective. So just to recap a little bit of what, what we've covered in finance, we looked at this idea of a broader concept of markets and then in finance we're interested mainly in financial markets so we said financial markets look at uh, facilitate the exchange of assets okay and uh, we don't make this distinction between asset markets and goods markets which is made in economics so when you're studying finance we look at we so we define a financial market or just a market as a venue which could be a physical venue uh, like a big you know uh, supermarket or where you have a big these big wholesale markets that you have or it could be a virtual venue as well which means it's uh, made because many of these modern markets today are nothing but uh, software platforms where everybody has the same software and they're all connected so kind of like uh, if you want to take a simplistic example of that that would be a whatsapp message board i mean a whatsapp group okay if everybody is connected in a large whatsapp group and you could actually do transactions that's also an example of a a market because it's a rich virtual forum for the exchange uh, where you can actually inter alia exchange two assets from one another so in particular we define a financial market as a as a venue for the exchange of two assets for one another and it's important to understand that if any of the assets changes okay it will create a different market let me explain what i mean by this if we go now to this let's look at this uh, this is like a a price table for gold actually gold and some of the other precious metals like palladium platinum silver etc but let's just look at the gold prices here you see that gold international the international market for gold the main market for price discovery in gold is the international uh, OTC market for uh, gold for uh, gold where one troy ounce of gold is the unit that is traded and the currency in which it is traded is uh, against which it is traded is US dollars. So that is the international uh, OTC market for gold, which trades literally 24 hours, uh, tw uh, 24 into 5, which is Saturday and Sunday the markets are closed. So this is the main international uh, market for price discovery in gold. So now if you look at this market, so as I said, the primary market for price discovery is the gold price in US dollars. So here you have two assets being traded. One is gold and one is US dollars. Okay, so US dollars is a currency and gold is a precious metal. And many people regard gold as also a currency as a sort of, as you know, gold used to be a currency uh, in, the, uh, in the old days. Okay, so now what happens is the point I'm trying to illustrate here is this. Because we've defined a market, these are very particular, these definitions are very strict. So you can actually, um, build a superstructure on this because they are very strict and they're going to be consistently applied uh, right across the board uh, and across the entire gamut of ideas that we will cover in finance so the definition of a market will never change it'll always be an ex a venue for the exchange of two assets for one another and we will define uh, refer also to markets in this manner here we refer to this as a as the gold market the main international market for gold now, the point I'm trying to say is, uh, the point I'm trying to establish here is that if either of the assets changes, it creates a different market. So the point here is, the point I'm trying to establish here is that if you look at this, look at the price here, it's 1280. If we just ignore the ask price, we'll just look at the bid prices. So you have, which means that one troy ounce of gold costs uh, 1280, let's round it off to 1281, 1281 US dollars. Now, if you change if you now start looking at the gold price in british pound sterling you see the figure is different it's no longer 1280 because this is a different market now because you've changed one of the assets the base asset remains the same gold but the terms asset has changed now you're pricing gold in a different currency british pound sterling so the price is different it's 1006 this was 1281 so the point to understand is if when you're talking about gold and british pounds that's a different market from gold and US dollars. This kind of, uh, you know, uh, fastidious technical uh, uh, terminology has to be maintained. Uh, if we have, I mean, if, if we can maintain this, it will help us a lot in, in, in uh, being rigorous in the study of finance. Okay, so now moving on, this is all mostly a recap because we have discussed these points. Uh, now let's look at one more thing this is what are we actually coming to the real learning in this particular case is uh, the finance related learning is that we're going to learn about 
uh, transaction dates and settlement dates. So let's come to that. Okay. So here we've already discussed this point. So just uh, transactions as contracts to exchange assets. This is a new idea. Okay. So since financial markets are venues to exchange assets, every transaction in a financial market is a contract to exchange assets. Okay. So when you're contracting to sell one of the assets, you're contract to buy the other asset. If you buy one, you sell the other. So this is one point to note. And then we've already discussed these terms, base asset and terms asset, which is a generalization to all assets, all asset classes from the terms that are used in the currency markets, which are base currency and terms currency. All right, because the currency is a species of asset. So now what we're saying is that the base asset is the particular asset whose one invariant unit is being constantly priced and repriced in the market. That's the base asset. And the asset in whose terms the base asset is being priced is called the terms asset. Okay, so if you go back to our example of the gold market, here when we're looking at gold in terms of US dollars, you are actually, here gold is the base asset because it's always one troy ounce of gold. And if you look at this price, 1280, okay, is so one troy ounce of gold now costs uh, 1281, rounded off 1281 US dollars. But it's it's not always like this because uh, you could have uh, we just change and get a we can easily see how this price changes, and we can establish this point that uh, in this gold market, gold versus US dollars, uh, which is the international gold market, uh, the primary international gold market here, gold is the base asset and US dollars is the terms asset. And the point is that this 1280, 1281 is one troy ounce of gold, currently costs uh, 1281 US dollars, but it's not always like that. Uh, if you look at, if we change this, yeah, gold in terms of, look at this. Okay. So this you can see is is a current chart and you can see here just itself, uh, this is now, it's about 29 December, it's 1281 US dollars, gold and, uh, so one troy ounce of gold costs 1281 US dollars. But as you can see, if we go back to the, the starting point of this chart, uh, just here around 7th of August, and if you see the lowest point on this chart, is somewhere around 1160 which is around 15th August so 15th August 2018 the same one troy ounce of gold was not worth 1281 US dollars it was worth only about 1160 US dollars as you can see here 1159 okay so this is about 1159 if you position the cursor here it's about 1159 so this is what you see so therefore the point is the point of this chart is that when you have a market, typically when you have an actively traded market like the international gold market, the price of that one invariant unit of the base assets keep uh, of the base asset keeps fluctuating, and what fluctuates is really the number of units of the terms asset that are required to purchase one unit of the base asset. That's what is happening here. So from this date of 15th August, it used to be 1160 US dollars would buy you one troy ounce of gold. But because the gold price has been appreciated, appreciating slowly, today you, uh, on the 29th of December, like the year end roughly, you are required now to pay 1281 US dollars from 1160, all the way from 1160 it's gone up to 1281 US dollars that you have to pay for that same one troy ounce of gold. So the base asset and the one and therein unit of the base asset hasn't changed, but the number of units of the terms asset required to buy that one unit of the base assets that's changed and that keeps on changing in almost every actively traded market and that's where we say that you know that the price is fluctuating okay so um, this is to exp uh, right so this to explain once again to explain base asset and terms asset now this is where we are coming to actually the real learning from this case is uh, to understand the important distinction between a transaction date and a settlement date if you remember what we saw in the case uh, we saw that the uh, case the uh, transactions were the contracts were formed uh, in between uh, April to August of 1911 
and then the settlement date that was uh, common to these transactions was 30th December 1911 so that's quite a lot of difference so point is let's let's so therefore let's understand these uh, let's define these terms and let's understand the difference so since every transaction is a contract to exchange assets every transaction in a flash in the financial markets should lead automatic uh, normally uh, to an exchange eventually to an exchange of assets okay as that's when the contract is performed or discharged your obligations of the parties are discharged now so what happens on how do we define a transaction date the transaction date in terms of contract law is the date on which the counterparties agree on the terms of the contract so you have consensus added in etc communication of uh, offer and accept and acceptance okay so you have the conclusion of the contract or what we say is the formation of the contract that's what happens on the transaction date but it's not necessary for the exchange of assets to take place on the same date sometimes it does but mostly it doesn't so the exchange of assets contemplated by the contract in this typical financial market will occur on what we call the settlement date or the delivery date or the value date sometimes called the value date okay so if you see here again we are going to make a cross reference once again to law if you look at section 5 of the Indian Sale of Goods Act of 1930 uh, it's again essentially laying out this principle that the transaction date and the settlement date need not be the same they could be but they need not always be the same what does it say contract of sale offer to buy or sell acceptance of such offer conclusion of the contract I've already put it I have obviously put in these parts in the in the brackets and I've broken up the structure of the section like this to make it clear you know uh, to make uh, to help the understanding of the concepts the contract may provide for immediate delivery okay this is where the con transaction date and the settlement date would be the same immediate payment delivery payment by installments or both shall be postponed okay so if you look at this distinction so this point this distinction is important in financial markets because there are many different types of instruments that are traded in financial markets and one of the ways we distinguish between those instruments in fact the most important way to distinguish between those instruments uh, between some of those instruments is by reference to the value date or the settlement date and its relationship with the transaction date okay so if you see here below what we so we take this term value from it comes from FX and debt markets uh, so essentially it refers to the settlement date the date on which the assets are exchanged okay so if I say I buy Aussie if we say Aussie we normally mean Aussie against US dollars if I buy if I say I buy Aussie value 18 July which means that I buy whatever be the transaction date I through this contract I intend uh, to uh, fix a settlement date of 18 July which means I should get my Aussie on the 18th of July and I will pay you you are you your US dollars on the 18th of July so that's what the word value means okay so for instance we're talking about different types of instruments in if you look at again these are terms used mainly in FX and debt markets but we can exchange extend them to all markets some of them are used uh, mainly in the FX and debt markets so for instance three important types of instruments if we say value cash transactions value cash or instruments trading value cash it means that the transaction date and the settlement date are the same value Tom which means let's look at this let's, let's define uh, <coughs> the settlement date is uh, is T plus one so typically how we define these types of instruments or transactions as we say T plus one settlement T plus one which means that uh, one day after the transaction date one business day after the transaction day business days <coughs> which means that both markets uh, uh, both centers where where both the counterparties are located uh, should be uh, business days there is there should not be any holidays okay so therefore T plus one means uh, T is the transaction date plus one day for the settlement date so typically we define we talk about settlement days settlement dates as T plus zero or T plus one or T plus two and that's what it means two business days one business day etc so important terms to la la learn are transactions value cash which means uh, are also called value today 
this means the transaction date settlement date same uh, value Tom or value tomorrow which means transaction date plus settlement date will be T plus one value spot means usually uh, differs spot meet differs from asset class to asset class and also from jurisdiction to jurisdiction for instance US equities trade spot as T plus three basis but Indian equities now trade spot as T plus two uh, so it'll differ from market to market but in one very important market the world's biggest market the foreign exchange market the convention uh, is that uh, spot means T plus two two business days uh, from the transaction date two clear business days should be holidays in both the centers the one exception to that rule in the foreign exchange market is dollar Canada where spot means T plus one but this is just an exception normally we say spot means D, uh, T plus two okay so this is the point important point to learn here that we are going to now we have taken this uh, allusion to uh, settlement dates and transaction dates which exists in the case uh, but it's not so clear-cut and you know not really pinpointed or highlighted by the court but this is an important concept uh, these are important concepts in finance so we have recapped all we would learned about the exchange of assets occurring in financial markets every transaction in a financial market being a contract to exchange assets and then use that and then added the concepts of basic asset and terms asset that's also a recap and then we added this new idea of transaction dates versus settlement dates and how we can use the difference between the transaction date and the settlement date to highlight important uh, types, uh, distinctions between uh, important types of instruments, instruments value cash, value tom, value spot, etc. And we also saw as part of our uh, culture of cross, of interdisciplinary learning, uh, we also saw that the Sale of Goods Act uh, provides for this, I mean, refers to this idea that this transaction date and the settlement date need not be the same. All right, so that's the end of our discussion on this case of, uh, of uh, Jamal versus Daoud.